Hello fellow racing enthusiasts. Welcome to the first episode of the Vehicle Setup Bootcamp series. My name is Saidat and in this series I'll be covering the various fundamental topics that revolve around the science of engineering a race vehicle to suit both your driving style and the circuit specific demands from various types of race tracks. This series will aim at improving your basic vehicle dynamics and vehicle performance knowledge and by the end you'll have a better understanding of how to gauge the vehicle performance to suit your own driving style and improve your lap times. This series is aimed at an entry level target audience with minimal knowledge on vehicle dynamics and will thereby involve some fundamental explanations on the physics of different car parameters and their influence on car handling upon positional change. So for this series we're going to stick to circuit style race tracks as rally car dynamics are a bit beyond the scope of this level. Some of the types of cars we'll be looking at include GT3, GTE, LMP1 cars and RS01 GT cars. For this series, I've used Project Cars 2 on the PS4. I haven't used the steering wheel and instead I'm relying on the standard DualShock 4 controller for the PS4. So, if you're a beginner having trouble setting up your vehicle for sim racing and simcade games, or if you're simply interested in learning how specific subsystems of a race car work, please do sit back and enjoy the following videos. So, let's get started. This episode will mainly focus on the basics of vehicle dynamics, with tire forces and cornering performance being the main points of discussion. We will look at basic tire physics to understand how tires generate lateral and longitudinal force, the nomenclature and steps involved in the dynamic performance of a car through a corner, and the different types of steering situations you would face while taking a corner. Let's start with tire fundamentals. The first thing to remember about tires is that it is arguably the most important part of a vehicle. All the forces that act on the chassis go through the tires and every inertial force from the chassis side goes on to the road through the tires. Hence, without understanding the basics of tires and their effects on performance, it becomes difficult to set up the vehicle to suit your requirements. So here you can see a tire from the top view or the XY plane of the tire. The angular deviation of the tire from the vertical line in this view is what we call the steering angle delta. If you observe this area, you can see a small distortion in the tread pattern of the tire. This is known as a contact patch and as the name dictates, it is the point of contact of the tire with the road. Every point on the tire at the contact patch is temporarily at rest while the tire continuously rotates. This causes a strain and in turn stress is developed in the rubber of the tire. This distortion called elastic deformation generates a force that pushes the rest of the tire sideways. This is called the lateral force Fy. The direction in which the deformed treads point is not the same as that of the tire. This is because of the adhesive property of the tire with the tarmac on the road. This explanation can be better understood through the brush model which can be found in books such as race car vehicle dynamics and performance vehicle dynamics as referenced in the description of the video. The angle between the direction of motion of the tire contact patch, that is the direction of the tread, with respect to the direction in which the tire is actually facing is called the slip angle alpha. The slip angle is directly proportional to the lateral force generated, well mostly, at least in its linear range. This means that a greater slip angle or in other terms a, a greater deformation at the contact patch results in a greater lateral force. The ratio of lateral force to the slip angle is what we call the cornering stiffness and it's the slope of the graph shown here. When the tire faces in the direction of motion of the vehicle, the slip angle is zero and hence the lateral force as well. As the tire is turned, the slip angle increases and so does the lateral force. Due to the physical nature of the tires, the relation between the lateral force and slip angle becomes non-linear at higher slip angles. This is highlighted by the orange bubble here. Once the tire crosses a certain slip angle, there is a sudden drop in force. The crest of this graph is the point at which the highest lateral force is generated. If the slip angle increases beyond this point, the lateral force sharply drops and most if not all grip is lost. One point to keep in mind is that the cornering stiffness depends on various factors like the tire pressure, temperature and aerodynamic loads. This will be useful in the upcoming videos. Before we go any further, let's define some terms and axes for the vehicle. 
The first axis is the x-axis and it runs along the center line of the vehicle towards the front of the vehicle. The car rolls above this axis which means weight is transferred from one side of the car to the other above this axis. The next axis is the y-axis. This is the pitch axis and runs from the left to the right of the vehicle across the center. Pitching transfers weight between the front and rear axles of the vehicle. The final axis of the vehicle is the z-axis. The vehicle yaws or rotates above this axis and this is a very important phenomenon to keep in mind while going through the next few slides. The three axes intersect at the center of gravity of the vehicle and all forces acting on the vehicle generate moments about the appropriate axis running through the center of gravity. Up until this point, we have only looked at one tire. Now we'll see something called the bicycle model. This is simply a lumped mass representation of the entire vehicle with the front tire in this model representing the average of the two front tires in a car and likewise at the rear. This model is useful in understanding how a car goes around a corner. Let's assume the center of gravity is in the middle of the wheelbase of the car. When the car is under steady state cornering conditions, the velocities of the front and rear tires are as shown. To find out the instantaneous center about which the entire vehicle is rotating, we will use basic geometry and kinematic principles. Imaginary lines perpendicular to the velocities are extended and intersect at the instantaneous center. By this logic, if a line is extended from the instantaneous center of rotation to the center of gravity of the vehicle, we will obtain the velocity of the car. There are a few assumptions to be kept in mind while observing a vehicle as a bicycle model. Firstly, the steering angles and slip angles are considered to be quite small. Secondly, the cornering radius R is much larger than the length of the car. So through de geometric derivations, we can conclude that the angle subtended by the car at the instantaneous center is L by R. Because the vehicle is continuously turning, the car has an angular velocity omega about the instantaneous center. If we magnify this image, we will observe that there is an evident angle between the velocity of the vehicle and the heading direction of the vehicle. This, very much like the tire slip angle, is called the vehicle slip angle and is denoted by beta. From further geometric derivations, we can find a relation between the slip angles and the steering angle. The sum of the rear slip angle and the steering angle is equal to the sum of the front slip angle and the angle subtended at the center of rotation. This is the single most important concept to remember from this video. Now that the nomenclature has been established, let's go through the different phases experienced while taking a corner. Initially, the car starts in a straight line. When a steering input is given, slip is generated in the front tire. The lateral force generated by the front tire generates a moment above the center of gravity, and hence there's a sharp increase in angular slip rate called beta dot in the clockwise or positive direction. As the vehicle starts to turn, the rear tire generates a slip as well, and thereby generates a smaller moment above the CG in the opposite direction. At this instant, the beta dot value is still positive, but smaller than what it originally was. As the slip increases in the rear, the rear moment becomes greater than the front, and the beta dot direction flips, making the car yaw counterclockwise. This process is repeated for either one or multiple cycles, depending on how the car is set up, and finally it stabilizes. The speed and response of this cornering maneuver that we've just seen is dependent on something called yaw damping, and this depends on various factors such as CG position, tire parameters, stiffness values, and springs, just to name a few. You will understand this phenomenon better as we progress through the series. So we've finally made it to the main segment in this video. Let's go through the three types of steering characteristics you will encounter, namely understeer, neutral steer, and oversteer. In neutral steer, the CG of the vehicle is at the center of the wheelbase. Assuming tire parameters are equal at the front and the rear, the tires will have the same cornering stiffness. This means that they'll have equal slip angles and lateral forces at equilibrium. In understeer, you can see that the CG is biased towards the front. In order to counter the large moment created by the rear tire, the front needs to generate a much larger force to compensate for the shorter moment arm. Because of this, the front tire is closer to its performing limit as compared to the rear. In oversteer, the CG is rear bias, and hence the opposite effect is seen with the rear tire having to generate more lateral force. This naturally means that the rear tire is closer to its cornering limit. Now, let's place all three vehicles at a corner. In understeer, if the lateral force of the front increases any further, the front tire loses its grip, and there is an imbalance in the moment. 
As a result, the vehicle starts turning outwards and as seen in the yaw damping example, the vehicle needs time to stabilize and get back to the required yaw rate. In oversteer, the rear tire loses grip and the moment causes the positive yaw rate to increase. Stabilizing the car is much more difficult in this case and if the driver is inexperienced, the car tends to continue turning and eventually spins out. Now, there are two ways to rectify understeer and oversteer. Either you can control the steering input or you can reduce the speed. Controlling the steering alone might help in neutralizing the vehicle, but it costs you because it will take you off the ideal racing line. Reducing the speed will keep you on the line, but costs time as the oscillation time again depends on your damping parameters. The ideal way to deal with this is to use both techniques simultaneously. Looking at the mathematical derivation which we obtained for slip angles and steering input, we see the following layout for neutral steer. Let's use this as a reference. We're only going to observe equilibrium here and we're not looking at performance at the limit of the core, uh, at the limit of the tires. In understeer, the front slip angle is greater than the rear. For the same cornering angle, L by R, we see that a greater steering input is needed. This is a positive delta for steering addition and this is why we say that an understeering car needs more steering input to reach equilibrium. For oversteer, the rear slip angle is higher than the front. So in order to take the same corner, a lower steering input is needed. This is seen by the negative delta value added to the steering input. It is oversteering because for the same neutral input steering angle, the car steers too much and hence to correct it, the steering input must be decreased. You may need to rewatch this segment alone a few more times to fully grasp these observations. But when you do, you will be completely ready to move on to setting up your vehicle. Now let's look at understeer in a Ferrari 488 GT car around Barcelona. So in this view, you can very evidently see that the car is deviating from uh, the ideal racing line. From the top view, you'll be able to observe how the yaw rate changes as the vehicle enters and exits the corner. And from the cockpit view, you can see how the steering input changes. So initially, it's just adjusted for the corner and throughout the corner, it's at maximum, at the maximum right lock. As you can observe, uh, a very important thing to note is that the car turns in a lot easier in this case. But now, as you can see, the car continues to oscillate throughout the corner. Uh, this effect is more profound when you look at it from the top view. From the cockpit view, you can observe uh, the way the steering input changes and how constant correction is required in order to keep the vehicle stable throughout the corner. So I hope these videos were a little insightful and uh, gave you a better idea of what exactly understeer and oversteer looks like in a car. I understand this video is getting quite long, so I'll quickly wrap it up. To conclude, let me show you a procedure you can use to optimize your setup. This is not an official setup process, but is one that I've personally created based off of my engineering knowledge. The first step is to set up the base tire pressures and weight distribution. This gives you a reference mechanical balance and stiffness configuration to start with. The next step is to set up your wing angles for optimizing downforce and drag, followed by tuning your ride heights to zone into a specific region in the aero map. This part of the process is known as aero balance optimization. The final step is to optimize springs to restrict movement around the aero map and to also set a reference for mechanical balance tuning. After this, the anti-roll bar stiffness must be optimized for weight transfer as it affects cornering stability. Once this is set up, the camber and toe values can be optimized to, to improve cornering and straight line responsiveness. The final step for optimizing mechanical balance is to set up the differential ramp angle and preload values. This improves performance in slow speed corners upon entry and exit. The last step is to control wheel RPM variation through optimized gear ratios and final drive values. Once again, we'll get to these parameters in the upcoming videos. This is just an overview of what you can expect for the rest of the series. In the next episode, we'll look at the importance of aerodynamics and how to set up wing angles to suit your driving style and the circuit. With that, I'd like to conclude. Thank you very much for your time. I hope this has given you a good insight to the wonders of vehicle physics. I'm always open to suggestions and would appreciate feedback and queries in the comment section. Well, that's the checkered flag. Stay safe and thanks for watching. This is Saidat signing off.